all right let's let's continue so as i was saying thrashing is basically a situation where a page is too taking too long to be assigned a frame than being served or than being than being executed okay uh, it's taking too long to be assigned a frame now why does that happen thrashing happens when there are no enough frames in other words there are different there, there are situations where there are maybe no enough frames for instance there are already large programs that are already running or that are already being executed and therefore it cannot it cannot actually load another at that particular point not unless it replaces you remember the page replacement algorithms not unless it now uh replaces not unless it now replaces using one of those al algorithms okay so if but if, if it takes too long to replace a page to eject a page load it to the main memory and so that there can be a free frame then it, it takes too long then we say that situation is thrashing a program page is taking too long to to pay to be paged or to be assigned a frame rather than being executed okay so there are those situations when there are the, pro the situations when thrashing can happen number one when the program frames are already occupied by other large other large memories number two if the virtual memory itself is small right the smaller listen to this the smaller the hard disk the smaller the capacity of the hard disk, the ability. You remember the characteristics of memory. One was ability. Ability is just capacity. The, the smaller the ability of the hard disk, the smaller the virtual memory will be created. Okay. So if you have one terabyte of hard disk, you will find that uh, the process, the, if in the event that you actually run a lot of large programs in your computer, the operating system will create a virtual memory of, let's say, 100 GB. Okay, but what if you run on a, on a hard disk of 128 GB or an SSD of 128 GB, just take 10 GB, okay? Something like that. Because the smaller the hard disk, the smaller the virtual memory that will be created in the event that you begin loading a lot of big programs. But the, the bigger the hard disk or the SSD, the, the bigger the the so, so thrashing will not be occurring at a very frequent rate. So number one, the reason why thrashing occurs, number one, when there are already, all the frames have already been assigned and page replacement is not uh, occurring at any more, at any given moment during that time, okay? And then the other situation why thrashing can occur if your virtual memory space is small and virtual memory space is, is basically uh, is basically determined by the amount of space, the amount of the actual amount of space in the hard disk or the SSD. Okay, so uh, this is just something to to need thrashing. And also another factor that makes thrashing to occur is when the CPU is overutilized. Okay, so when we have a lot of uh, CPU utilization, other the CPU is already processing other pages. Okay, then thrashing will continue because the CPU has to be free to pick from it, it, so that it can finish up processing a page so that that page can be released so that now another page can actually be loaded into a frame okay, of the virtual memory. But if the CPU takes too long, so also this is determined by the power of the CPU, the, the speed of the CPU. Okay, so the, the CPU is slow, thrashing will also. If the CPU is low, thrashing will take or may take place, okay? So we have said that uh, if those are the factors that cause thrashing to happen, then what, are, what is the solution to thrashing? Number one, increase the amount of storage in the hard disk, okay? Number two, do not run a lot of big programs sequentially or not sequentially, simultaneously. That can be a solution. And number three, increase the power of the CPU, right? Those are basically the the solutions to thrashing, all right? Okay, so that brings us to the end of virtual memory, okay? So now we are, at, uh, this was the topic I was telling you, we are not going to go through chapter four, hardware components of a computer system. As you can see, this is just about the things you know, control unit, arithmetic and logic unit, uh, keyboard, mouse, these are just the things that you know. So uh, this is a topic that the topic I was telling you, I don't have to, really uh, teach you 
know, into devices, scanners, still these things. So this is the topic I was telling you. I'm not intending to, to go through with you. Daisy wheel uh, dot matrix printers, gram printers, line printers, number printers. These are the things I was telling you. I don't have to go through. If, if it's cache memory, we already discussed cache memory and the, even the technical details associated to the cache in chapter two, memory, organization, and hierarchy. Uh, we talked about all this. So I want us now to go to <coughs> chapter five, microprocessor organization. Because before we go to chapter five, could there be any question about the things we just learned in uh, virtual memory? Virtual memory. Are there anything that you need to ask? Or you can just basically type your question in the chat area and then as we continue, I'm going to check and answer. Okay, let me just continue. So if you have any question, you just type in the chat area. As I continue, I'm going to answer. All right. So let us discuss chapter five, microprocessor organization. So now we looked at the memory organization. You remember memory organization and there we discussed all the technical details of the memory, all right? When we discussed the hierarchy, yeah? the, you know, the, the registers, the cache, the RAM, the magnetic disk and the magnetic and the, and the optical disks, the magnetic disk and the magnetic tapes or what you call auxiliary storage, okay? So magnetic this and magnetic tapes, they basically lie on uh, this topic that I'm telling you, I don't have to take you through. Yeah, all these kinds of storage, secondary memory, okay? These kinds of things. So they fall under that. So what was very, very important is these technical details that you did not learn anywhere else. The registers, the cache, and the RAM, and the virtual memory, and the technical details associated to them and how they work. So, having discussed that, so we need now to go after memory organization, we need now to look at microprocessor organization. So now here we are going to discuss technical details related to the microprocessor, okay? Now, the first thing to define or talk about is what is a microprocessor. A microprocessor is just simply this, the CPU of a microcomputer. Okay, the microprocessor is a CPU of a microcomputer and a microcomputer things like the desktop PC, like the one I'm using right now, laptops, uh, tablets, smartphones. Okay, those are microcomputers, computers that are small. You remember the classification of computers and the third class, the first classification was classification according to physical size and processing power. There you talked about supercomputers, mainframe computers, mini computers, and microcomputers, right? So microcomputers are basically the smallest, and they also have the smallest kind of speed, the, the lowest kind of speed. And in microcomputers, we have laptops, desktop PCs, tablets, uh, and also smartphones. Okay. So the microprocessor is the CPU of a micro computer. Are we together? Now, what are the functions of a microprocessor? What are some of the basic functions of a microprocessor? And then we can now look, we can then, I can now give you probably an outlook of how the microprocessor looks, okay? Uh, what are the functions? Number one, it basically does arithmetic and logic operations. And it does this inside its unit called the arithmetic and logic unit. Do you remember when we were doing von Neumann architecture, we discussed how the CPU looks like or how the, C the logical parts of a CPU, right? The arithmetic and logic unit, the control unit, and the main memory, right? Where we say memory is really not a part of the CPU, but it's a device that works with the CPU. Okay. Basically, we talked about that. So the first function of the microprocessor is to perform arithmetic and logic operations. Arithmetic and logic operations are just mathematical operations. Addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, frequency, range, uh, uh, what are these, median, mod, um, and all those kind of things, solving mathematical problems. Logical 
operations are operation are what we call decision making operations eg uh, if 10 you can create a program like uh, i don't know if you've been introduced to structured programming at some point maybe you will you, will. you can create a program where you, you just create a program that allows the user to enter two numbers if the first number is greater than the second number then it says the first number is greater than the second number else the second number is greater than the first number that is basically what you call a logical operation a decision making operation are we together or let me give you a very simple decision making operation for instance you want to copy a file from the hard disk to a flash disk that you have connected all right so you've connected a flash disk and you want to copy a file from a hard disk to a flash disk before it copies, when you click copy, you select your files or your folders, whatever you're copying, and then you click copy or you drag and drop to the flash disk. Before, before the computer actually begins to copy, it will first do what? It will check the size, the amount of space required for those particular files and check whether they can. there is free space in that particular flash disk to actually hold that particular mini, okay? So it can only move those files or copy those files if the space in that flash disk is greater than or equal to the space occupied by those files or folders in the hard disk. Isn't that correct? That is actually correct, right? Like if you are, if you are moving, um, let's say 5 GB of files you know, and folders, 5 GB of files or of a folder, a folder that is 5 GB. You're moving it from the hard disk to the flash disk. Before it actually begins to move it or to copy it, it will check if your flash disk has 5 GB and more or more. 5 GB or more. If it doesn't have at least 5 GB, then it, it will tell you, it will give you a message like there is no enough space in the local disk F to copy the selected files so you copy the selected folder now what what has the computer done it has done a logical operation a decision making operation in other words it has to decide whether to copy those files or whether not to copy them and a condition has to be tested and the condition there is what whether or not you have enough space in your flash disk. okay so basically that is a logical operation are we together? It's a very, very simple logical operation. So those are what we call logical operations, and they are performed in the logical unit. So the first, the first uh, function is the first function is to perform arithmetic operations and logical operations. Then the other uh, is to move processes from one location to another. Is to move processes or instructions from one location to another. For instance, the processor can move files, or not files, instructions, the results of instructions that it has executed from the CPU to the RAM, all right, or from the CPU to the hard disk. If you are typing a file, if you are typing a word file, what you are doing when you are typing, it's storing, right? It's converting all those into bits, right? Because the yeah, computer understands in binary language, you know, information in binary language so as you're typing as you save it it does it the cpu converts all those into bits all right and then it transfers those bits into the hard disk so there is that data transfer that is done by the by the cpu it can take to the hard disk it can also take to the to the speaker for output so that if it's music you are you are playing basically the instruction for playing that music the play instruction is basically being executed by the processor Okay. But then the output is being heard in the, in the earphones or over the speaker. All right. So it also there is that basically the transfer of data or instructions or the results of processing from the processor to other parts of the computer system. All right. So there's that data transfer that works that the microprocessor does. And then it also has a program counter register that stores the address of next instruction based on the value of PC. The microprocessor jumps from one location to another and takes decision. So number three function of the microprocessor is just this simple this, to store the address of next instructions, to store the address of next instructions. Now these addresses are stored in basically, they are carried 
by a particular bus called the address bus. You remember in the von Neumann architecture, uh, the address bus is the one that carries the address of a data packet or a data token. Okay, data packets and data tokens, those are anyway. Those are terms that are used especially for networking, but I'll just use them for your understanding. Data bits, let's say that. So the microprocessor basically does these three functions. Number one, to perform arithmetic and logic operations. Number two, to transfer data instructions from the microprocessor to other parts of the system, like other storage devices and output devices. And then number three, to basically mark the addresses of instructions. Okay. Also, you can also give other functions like what? Uh, it has a control unit that manages and coordinates all the activities of the processor. That's also a function of the PC. Okay. So the microprocessor basically works like all the structure looks like this. After this, I'm going to show you now the basic, basically the image of how it really looks like as you can, when you hold it in the eye, okay? I really don't have one, but I'm going to just uh, show you, or I'm just going to, there, there is a picture here in the notes, I'm going to lead you there. But anyway, this is the structure that looks like, this is the logical structure, how it looks like, okay? So here we are, we have the arithmetic and logic units, we have the control units, we have a flagging, a flagging area, a flagging area, a flagging area of the, of the, you know, a flagging area of the CPU. Have you ever, I hope you have ever heard, of course, the term to flag. To flag is basically to give a notification. It's basically a computing term that just says give a notification, okay? Like you can actually flag, a, you can flag a content in a website so that Whenever you visit that website, you can actually access it because you flagged it. It's like you marked it. Okay. So uh, this flagging area in the CPU is basically to do what? To mark important things that the CPU has to do. It's like a reminder. Okay. It's like a reminder. All right. So it kind of gives the CPU an overall, it kind of gives the CPU an overall uh, a service that helps to remind the CPU what it needs to do at a particular time so that it does not you know, forget. Of course, I'm using those terms so that, uh, for your understanding. So a, flag, a flagging area is just for two. It's, a, it's the CPU's reminder, okay? It flags particular activities that they see, or it marks particular activities that the CPU, the CPU needs to give attention to, okay? It marks, for instance, an instruction that has been loaded and it has it has been loaded and it has taken too long for it to be assigned a slot. A slot is basically a time in the CPU. You remember job scheduling, job sequencing, right? Or uh, a, a page, a page that needs to be ejected so that another page can be given priority. So those are some of the things that the CPU might want to be aware of so that it can keep performing. So the flagging region of the CPU is basically to to remind it or to tell the CPU of things, critical activities it is supposed to do at particular times, okay? Then of course the control unit is used to manage and coordinate all the activities, right? And the control unit works with the control bus. As so you remember the databases, data bu the buses, data bus, address bus, control bus, eh? So the control unit works with the control bus. The control bus is basically the pathway that takes signals from the control unit to all the other parts of the CPU, okay? All right? Uh -huh. Then there is the register array. Register array, uh, uh, you'll, know, you'll talk about array when you're talking about programming. An array is basically, in programming, it's basically a dynamic variable that stores many other variables of the same type. Yeah, so a register array is basically a particular register that stores many program instructions of the same nature, okay? It's called a register array. So they are all stored here. And why are they stored here temporarily? Because the register is a high-speed memory. You remember that in computer, you know, I mean in memory organization, the registers are top in the pyramid, right? And then there is an instruction decoding unit this is the unit of the CPU that basically converts 
high level language instructions from high level language to machine level or low level language. So high level language is your user instruction. For instance, your instruction, you're going to give the computer an instruction like open file. Now open file is high level, it is in your language, but it needs to be converted into machine language bits. Okay, so this is the particular area of the CPU that does that. Okay, it decodes an instruction, okay? And uh, there is what we call the PC stroke IP. Now we've looked at the PC here, program counter register that stores the address of the next instruction. So this basically this region of the CPU, its work is to store the address of the next instruction that waits to be processed, okay? And of course there is this extension called IP. IP just, it's just, it stands for internet protocol. If you've done a little bit about computer networking, IP stands for internet protocol. A protocol is just a standard for communication. So basically this region, we can say that it has two particular functions. One function is to hold the address of the next instruction waiting to be processed and also to store a set of protocols, a set of protocols or standards that guide the whole of the CPU to function. Okay. Now, uh, in an exam scenario, you can actually be given uh, this, uh, but this uh, particular structure of the microprocessor and then you are told to name each of these parts and what is their function. I have just explained the function of each. Okay. All right. So clock speed of different microprocessor, the clock speed of different microprocessor. Uh, I think when you are when you have been dealing with laptops and computers for some time, so sometimes you can look at the properties of a computer and it tells you 16 bits, I mean, uh, no, 16 bits are not low bits there, but there are actually 32-bit machines and 64-bit machines, all right? Now, 32-bit and 64, these are basically standards for determining that are standards for clock speed of different microprocessors, okay? So, most of these ones are 16-bit microprocessor, 16-bit machines are not really so much there. Those are very, very slow machines. They're not very there. If you, if you go to the vendor and you ask for a machine that is 16-bit, really, it's not really there. Yeah, machines, no, modern machines normally start from 32-bit and then 64-bit, okay? So the clock speed is measured in that 16-bit, 32-bit and 64 bit basically a bit when you say 16 bit we are just saying how many bits can travel through a bus in a particular single mm -hmm. system time okay 16 bits so when you say 32 bits we are saying that uh, a data bus can transfer 32 you know i can transfer bits at a rate of 32 bits 32 bits per microseconds. So you understand that microprocessors use microseconds to time. Yeah, they don't use nanoseconds. Nanoseconds is a very fast technology probably for supercomputers. But for microcomputers, they use microseconds. <coughs> so 32 bits per microsecond. So of course, you are talking about a lot of, a bulk of bits per second. A very bulk of, a very big bulk of bits per second, which makes it a very fast microprocessor. And uh, under it, we have different kinds of uh, processors. There are processors that are made by a company called Intel. There are processors that are made by a company called Pentium. Okay. So there are Intel processors and Pentium processors. So if you open in a, inside your laptop and just remove the, the I, I don't have really, a, but I'm going to upload for you a, a video that demonstrates how to open and access there because I don't have it, okay? I can't I can do it, I don't have a laptop here, all right? So I can't really, really show you how that is done, but it's the YouTube, I've, YouTube there are very many videos, so I'm going to upload for you at least a video that I think can help you to see how to open up, open and access the process and actually have a processor. So most of the time a processor is normally, just like any other product, it is, it has a label. So there are processors that have a label of Intel, meaning that they are made by Intel. Intel, 
and Pentium. The thing about processors is that, apart from probably Apple, all the other brands of computers, they use either an Intel or a Pentium processor. Okay, an Intel or a Pentium processor. But there's another one, there's another one which is a bit faster that is actually producing microprocessors that have uh, what we call, uh, trying to remember the name, Turbo, Turbo processors there, but oh no, Turbo is not the tag or the brand. There is a particular brand that produces a you know, Turbo processor. Turbo processors are processors that really have a high speed. Okay? So it's not just Intel and Pentium, there's another one. But these are just the basic ones, the Intel and the Pentium. And they produce microprocessors, like uh, there are microprocessors that have a uh, have, uh, speed of 16 megahertz to 33 megahertz. A hertz is basically cycles per second. A hertz, hertz, in other words, a hertz is H-E-R-T-Z. Hertz is basically a measure of frequency, cycles per second, okay? So mega hertz. So mega is million, 16 million cycles per second. That is a fast kind of processor, 33 million hertz cycles per second. And Intel 8486, they have their brands have, uh, they, have they produce processors that range from 16 to 100 megahertz. Pentium, they have uh, 66 megahertz, okay? Basically, these are just clock speed notations, okay? Clock speed notations. Then for 64-bit microprocessors, we have the Intel Core, the Intel i7, the i5. I, I think now you are now familiarizing with this, eh? with these terms. I think you had a computer which is i3, uh, i5. Now, what uh, an i is basically a core, okay? It's like a, a notation for a core. So you, when you say i5, you are just saying that that computer has five logical units and each logical unit works like a single CPU. So if you have i7, it's like a computer that has one CPU. It, you know, it is a computer which has one CPU, but it works as though it has seven CPUs. So in other words, each a, a computer that is i7 basically has seven mm -hmm. cores. A core is basically a logical a logical area of the CPU that works like a CPU of its own, right? So core i7 are fast, core i5 are fast, core i3 are fast, okay? But of course, the speed goes up. i3 is, i7 is faster than i5 and i5 is faster than i3. So like my laptop, which actually got spoiled and I am not using it right now, that's why I'm using a desktop. Uh, is i5 and it's a it's a it's a high speed machine but if i were to get an i7 machine it's even faster so if you have an i5 machine working on a 4gb ram and an i7 machine working on a 4gb ram i7 is faster okay so an i is just a con annotation of a core okay a core like a computer that has one processor but it works as though it has different processors that processor works as though it is divided into different processors okay and therefore it makes it fast because each processor can execute different things. So this is basically clock speed notations. Yeah. My Core i5 HP or my Core i5 was uh, 2.6 gigahertz. It's not dead though, it's just, just faulty. I'm trying to correct it. Uh, 2.6, 2.6, yeah. But of course, there are i3s with 2.9, such kind of things. So those are basically clock speed notations. Okay. Let's see our time is running out. I don't know how fast we are going with this topic anyway. Uh, let's look at uh, types of processors now these are basically brands okay these are not types intel pentium these are not types of processors. they are brands they are companies that produce processors so different kinds of again i i don't know if i told you different computers different computer brands like hp dell uh you know, name them. all of them they either use an intel or pentium all right so they just pick the parts and they assemble so they just 
buy, buy, you know, buy from Intel or from Pentium. Apart from Apple, Apple makes its own devices. That's why it's expensive because they are all in-house developed. They have their own screens. They develop their own processors. They develop their own RAMs. That is why they are very unique and expensive because they are all in-house. They are not packaged. They are not assembled. But if you're talking about HP and Dell, that's why they are very cheap because they, they buy a processor from Intel. They buy monitors from a certain other company. They buy mini and then they package using their own computer. That's why they are a little bit cheap. Anyway, types of processors. I can see we have less than eight minutes remaining. So types of processors. We have reduced instruction set computers, RISC processors. And then we have complex instruction set computers, CISC processors. So we have two types of processors, RISC processors and CISC processors. Let's begin with reduced instruction set computer processors, RISC processors. We also have explicitly parallel going to talk about that. Uh, RISC. These are computer architecture which where that processes simple instructions per given CPU time. So RISC, they are basically known for handling simple instructions. Okay, so simple instructions are executed quickly, but it only does that for simple instructions. Okay, so instructions get completed in one clock cycle because of the open optimization of instructions and pipelining. Don't worry about this. Concept called pipelining. I'm going to teach you. Uh, pipelining. Pipelining is basically a. Sorry, I, uh, I was trying to talk with someone here. We have less than six minutes remaining. So let's talk about reduced instruction. Let's just say what it is in a nutshell. RISC processors are processors that can work on simple instructions, a process that can work on simple instructions fast. That's just the basic uh, undergirding concept behind RISC processors are processors that work on simple instructions first, okay? Examples are IBM, International Business Machine, IBM RS6000, MC88100, DC Alpha, and all these DC Alpha models. So these are examples. You're going to go to the notes and check them. I don't have to really talk about the examples so much, okay? So go check these particular examples of computers, I mean processors. Then we have complex instruction. It's just the opposite of reduced instruction. Complex instruction, CIC, CISC processors are processors that have an ability to work on many or more complex instructions per given micro or nanos, uh, per given microsecond, okay? Per given microsecond. As you can see in the notes, uh, they can execute multiple low-level operations like loading from memory, storing into memory, or arithmetic operations. And then it has multiple addressing nodes within a single instruction. So CSC makes use of very few registers because itself is fast. Okay, so it doesn't have to use a lot of registers. Why? Because the sooner, no sooner, no sooner has a you no know, sooner has a program or program threads been loaded to a register than the CPU has already picked it for processing. So it does not need 
a lot of registers because uh, the few registers can support because it's fast. Yeah, it fetches lots, fetches lots very fast, so it doesn't need a lot of registers to keep for it temporarily. Okay, so CISC. So what is the difference? Reduced instruction set computers they can work on simple and few instructions per second and work on them fast. Okay, and complex instruction set computer they can work on complex instructions and many instructions per given microsecond and work on them fast, even without needing many registers. Okay, so we have Intel 386. So if you have an Intel machine, basically you have a CISC processor. If you have an Intel, uh, you know, not an Intel machine, a process, a machine that has an Intel processor, uh, basically you have a good processor, you have a processor that is CISC. Yes, it's a CISC processor. So you have Intel 386, Intel 486. Also, if you have Pentium processor, if you have a Motorola processor, basically you have a CISC processor, a processor that can work on multiple and complex instructions per given time. We together there. Then explicitly parallel are called EPIC processors. They permit the computer to execute instructions parallel using compilers. So they, uh, they permit computer to execute instructions parallel using compilers. It allows complex instructions execution without using higher clock frequencies. And uh, EPIC, the, uh, the processors encodes this instruction into 128-bit bundles. So you see, you know, we, we had 32-bit, 64-bit, now these are 128-bits. Okay. Each bundle contains three instructions which are encoded for 21 bits and each, each, each and a five bit template field which can be executed by a given time in the pipeline. So, EPIC, these are explicitly parallel instruction com computing processors, are processors that work hand in hand with compilers. Right now, if you've done any programming before. There is a concept called compiler. A compiler is basically a tool in a programming IDE. An IDE is an integrated development environment like code blocks, Dev C, NetBeans, a software that you use to write programs and execute them. So a compiler is basically a tool that basically builds your code. It takes all your code, I mean, it takes all your code, source code. And then it converts it into object code. Object code is like code that a computer can read like one code. So code yako, code yako man can different lines, on different lines, it has different things. So what the compiler does, it builds it, it picks that code and converts source code. Your code is called the source code, the raw code, and it converts it to object code. In other words, that code is viewed as one. Okay. The CPU looks at that code as one. Therefore, what that does is it makes processing easy because it doesn't have to process each line. Okay? It processes all of it as one. So basically, uh, I can see we have less than a minute. I'm going to create another session. Basically, EPIC are just uh, processors that work hand in hand with compilers. So a compiler does what? Every instruction you give it, all the multiple instructions are given as one. Okay, they are seen as one, and then now the processor can process it. What that does is that it makes it faster, right? Than even CISC. Okay. So let me create another, let me create another session, and then we're going to join. What, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you 10 minutes break, and then after 10 minutes, you go to the portal, you'll see a session of created. Okay. 